Council on any matter shall approach the City Council, give their name, and limit their presentation to three minutes. State law generally precludes the City Council from discussing or acting upon any topic initially presented during oral communications. Would any members of the public like to speak? Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. My name is Darren Case. Before I begin, can you guys disclose whether you made any progress or any activity on the IBWC litigation in closed session? We can't discuss whether no problem. any items that were. I attended the August 1st press conference where Imperial Beach announced their intent to file a lawsuit against the IBWC. At the press conference, IB Mayor Serge Jadina said, quote, we have already asked the city of Coronado to join us. That was over a month ago, and this train is about to leave the station. I'd like to help you make a decision by breaking it down. This is about transborder sewage. It's about poop. The poop comes from Mexico. There are sewage spills, and the poop goes into the, into the United States. When the Tijuana River is flowing, the poop is flushed into the ocean. The current often pushes the poop north into Coronado, where people like me get sick, and we have beach closures. What we need to do is stop the poop. How do we do that? Sewage infrastructure. How do we get infrastructure? Money. Who has the money? The federal government. The US section of the IBWC is the federal government, and we've got them on violations of state permit and federal Clean Water Act. These are egregious violations. This is a no-brainer. Now, Mayor Dedina has said about the lawsuit, quote, this is not rocket science. This requires funding. That is spot on. This is about applying pressure to the federal government for funding of sewage infrastructure. Now, IB is one city. If Coronado joins the lawsuit, that would be two cities. So if Coronado joins, we can double the pressure on the federal government to stop the poop. Mayor Dedina has made it clear that the city of Imperial Beach is taking the strongest legal action possible because their residents are demanding it. Many Coronado residents, including myself, are now demanding that Coronado join the lawsuit. To be clear, this is not bullying. This is a classic exercise of the First Amendment to the Constitution of the United States of America. The right of the people to petition the government, that's you, for a redress of grievances. And we have grievances. What do we want? Clean water. When do we want it? Yeah. What do we want? Clean water. When do we want it? That's right, we want it now. As a courtesy to the city of Imperial Beach and to the citizens who are fighting so hard for clean water, you need to make a decision without further delay. S-O-S. Save our seas! S-O-S. Save our seas! Thank you. Mayor, distinguished council members, Thank you for allowing me to approach. We have grievances. I live in the Tijuana River Valley, and I am a former. Can you please state your name? Yes, my name is Baron Partlow. Very sorry, Mayor. Um, former um, resident of Imperial Beach. I'm a world-class body surfer, and I can't even use my beach. And it hurts. I can't even take my grandson in the water. Yes, we have grievances. And uh, the International Boundary and Water Commission, the Mexican session is section is Scylla. They're in bed with the Mexican section, the U.S. section. They will not solve anything. They are secret at best, and they don't do anything to really represent the people that they were put in place to represent. And as Mr. Case said, the people have that decision. And in this case, you are the people as well. And I know that there's not a, a more hardworking, honest, intelligent, sensible group of people with integrity who will do the right thing even when the right thing is not the popular thing to do that the Coronado City Council is. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Cheryl Quinones. I'm a resident of Imperial Beach. I've lived there since 1963. Prior to that, I lived on the bay in the uh, Navy housing where my dad was a SEAL from 1955 to 79. I was here when the bay was full of muck that we'd step out as children 
and and became sand uh, quicksand to our knees. I remember when the bay was filthy polluted. I remember how hard Coronado worked to clean our bay and how beautiful and, and, and glimmering it is today. And that's because of the city's work, your city's work, and your community's uh, desire to keep that golden crown that sits above your head shiny and gold. City of Imperial Beach has always been looked at as a poop town. We do not want the jewel of San Diego, the crown, the Coronado crown, to be named poop town. We need your help. Imperial Beach needs your help. Please help us. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Gabriela Torres. I'm a native San Diegan, a local environmental lawyer, and the current policy coordinator for the No Border Sewage Program at Surfrider Foundation. Surfrider Foundation is a nonprofit environmental organization that is 100% focused on protecting our beaves, beaches, waves, and oceans. We do this by championing policy. We do this by fighting legal battles to protect our coasts and bringing awareness to issues of concern. We also achieve this by direct fundraising. I am here today to speak to you about the sewage problem that is affecting the Tijuana River Valley. This problem affects beaches as far north as Coronado. In February 2017, we experienced the largest sewage spill in this, this decade. According to U.S. estimates, between 143 million to 230 million gallons of raw, untreated sewage, which is exactly what you flush down your toilet, was dispensed into the Tijuana River Valley and filtered into our oceans. According to Me Mexican estimates, that number was 28 million gallons of sewage. And I have to support the residents of Imperial Beach who continue to say that one gallon of raw sewage is one gallon too many. We are now 211 days after that initial spill. There has been no federal cleanup effort, no speak about federal funding, and there have been at least 14 additional small-scale spills. Surfrider is actively engaged on this issue. We're advocating before elected officials, and we're meeting with stakeholders on both sides of the border. Progress is slow. We are conscious that there has never been a champion in Congress to take this issue on. Likewise, there's never been an agency that has been dedicated and had enough funding to push this issue through. There needs to be a solution. As a result of no solution, the city of Imperial Beach has for decades been left to fight what is a binational battle on their own, while the issue has implications for all of us who visit our oceans. Surfrider is calling on you today to support the lawsuit that Imperial Beach has filed against the International Boundary and Water Commission so that Imperial Beach does not have to go at this alone. This is not a problem of, 28, 000, of, of a population of 28,000 people. It is a problem that affects us all. With that said, I'd also ask you all as individual constituents to sign Surfrider San Diego's most recent action alert that demands that our local congressional representatives form a bipartisan solution to the sewage problem. Ocean sewage knows no boundaries, and it knows even less about politics. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. My name is Linda Heath, and I am an Imperial Beach resident. This sign is present on our beaches more times uh, each day than we have it open. Um, we are concerned because there are other beaches in this area which do receive the sewage. Coronado is one. Imperial Beach, San Isidro, Chula Vista, National City. We are endeavoring to persuade you to join us in our battle for this because Coronado has a special function that Imperial Beach does not and it involves uh, national security. It's called our beloved Navy SEALs who cannot train and training is postponed which is a national security issue because they cannot get in the water. 
We also have the Border Patrol who has to get in the water. There have been several incidences of illness-related uh, problems for the Border Patrol, for our uh, lifeguards, and potentially for our Navy SEALs. I, for one, am asking on my own behalf, on behalf of the city of Imperial Beach and our United States, please join us in our endeavor to stop this from happening. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mayor Bailey and City Council members. My name is Shannon Johnson. I'm an Imperial Beach resident, and I'm also a member of the South Bay Clean Water Movement. Since March, we've been raising awareness and have delivered nearly 3,000 letters from residents of the South Bay cities with regards to the cross-border sewage spills that have been continuously polluting our beaches. At the last council meeting, we presented you with a stack of letters from your residents urging the city of Coronado to join Imperial Beach in their lawsuit against the IBWC. Over the last two weeks, we have partnered with the Coronado Surfing Association and have collected over 50 additional letters from your constituents, which we hope you will take into serious consideration. We appreciate your support and response thus far, and we encourage you to join the lawsuit with the IB as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, Councilman, uh, my name is John Weisbarth, Council members, I should say. Uh, I'm a longtime resident here at Coronado, first city council meeting. Uh, didn't necessarily know if I was going to come up and speak, but I, I do feel compelled to uh, throw my support behind uh, this body finding some solution, or at least starting to find a solution to what has long been a problem. That's what we're all talking about here with the, the pollution of our waterways. We know where it comes from. Uh, it's a complicated issue. I don't know enough about the lawsuit or what it's proposing. I don't know what the best course of action is, but I am here to urge you guys to please do what you can to discover what that is and take some meaningful action that can address this problem. It's, it's not a new problem. We know that. And as, a, as an avid surfer who spends a lot of time in the water, I understand what a lot of residents here understand. It's not just about staying healthy. This is also about our economy. And it's not good for a, a town that, that does a lot of its business in the summer when tourists come here to have closed beaches or to have national news about how polluted it is. So let's do this for the environment. Let's do it for the health of the community. Let's do it for the tourist dollars. Whatever it takes, let's figure out how to solve this problem. And if throwing our support behind the lawsuit that IB is going to do is the best way, then I'm all for that. If there's another more meaningful way, then I'm for that as well. But I do urge you all to please come up with some sort of meaningful action. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Wayne Strickland, Coronado resident. And uh, I also have some properties in Imperial Beach. Um, I'm kind of an old time surfer dude <laughs> that uh, used to surf with Brian Bilbray over at the pier in IB in the old days. Uh, Brian Bilbray, of course, you know, was a mayor of IB later on. He's, he tried to do a bulldozer and stop the sewage uh, years ago when he was mayor. It was quite the show. Uh, it made a lot of headlines, but we really didn't get it done then. I believe now we have a chance to join with Imperial Beach and actually get something done. Um, I believe that we should put, an, put a cap on it, the amount that we uh, donate equal to Imperial Beach's, and I shouldn't say donate, the amount that we're suing for with a cap to match Imperial Beach's. And I think that we, we shouldn't just let them go alone. We should really try and help our neighboring city and help our own residents who happen to love this beach as much as I do and uh, do something. Thank you very much. Thank you, Wayne. Good 
Mayor Bailey, council members, my name is Barry Groby. I live at 516 4th Street, and I am the president of the Coronado Lawn Bowling Club. And I'm here today to speak to item 10C, um, which is the resolution to ban uh, gas-powered blowers and leaf uh, and uh, weed whackers or whatever they are. Um, anyway, I... I didn't know this item was coming before the council. I was taken a little bit by surprise and uh, had to hurry up and <laughs> create an explanation of the uh, bowling green and its maintenance um, before some other kind of decision gets made. Um, the, the, bowling, the Coronado Lawn Bowling Green, or the Spreckles Bowling Green now, is a public park. It belongs to the city of Coronado. It doesn't belong to the Lawn Bowling Club. Um, through an agreement with the city, um, starting back in 2010 when the green was reopened, uh, the members of the Lawn Bowling Club uh, partner with the city for the maintenance of the green. All of the equipment, all of the fuel, all of the, um, the conduits to the green maintenance are provided by the city of Coronado, um, and the um, Lawn Bowling Club provides approximately 700 hours or 90 or so days person days of work maintaining the green. And that involves a couple of things. One is the green has to be, um, it, you have to clear debris off of that green in order to play and in order not to uh, make the carpet even worse or l reduce its life expectancy. Um, we have pine trees. We have five huge pine trees on the north side and the west side. Two of those trees died a couple of years ago and got replaced by two more of the same tree. Um, what, on a day like today with the uh, heavy winds, we will go back to the green and it will the, the west side and the north side will be covered with pine needles. There's no way to get those off of the green other than to blow them. You can't. Uh, we have a sweeper. But the sweeper is meant to rough up the carpet and lift up small particles. It can't do anything about pine needles. Um, and it reduces the life expectancy if you do that too often. Uh, we have something called Billy Goat, which is a vacuum cleaner. Um, but we cannot lower Billy Goat low enough to pull up pine needles because it will pull up the sand that caught it, that's the surface underneath that carpet that's required. So the only way to do it is with the blowers. What we do is we blow the pine needles off of the green into the ditches, the sand ditches around the green, and then members will go and rake the pine needles up, put them in buckets, and put them in green waste. And we fill a lot of green waste bins. Um, so all I'm here Barry, to do, to summarize. I'm summarizing, um, I, I don't think that going to electric powered blowers will make a significant difference to the maintenance of that green. What worries me is in the background of all of this is perhaps we're moving toward a ban on all blowers and that would be a travesty for the green. And, and I want to ask you to stop right there if you don't mind. Okay. Thank you very much. Mayor Bailey's uh, City Council. My name is Colin McMahon, and I'm the local manager of a company called Line Bike. And uh, what you see in front of you is is a Line Bike Bike Share Bike that can be uh, revolutionary in terms of transportation, local transportation here on the island and in San Diego County. Uh, this bike is unique in that it's like car to go, in that there's no docking station similar to Deco bike. You pick it up and you drop it off at the nearest bike rack or between the curb and the sidewalk. Uh, we think that this could be a great opportunity to reduce uh, Navy traffic here on the island, uh, uh, help reduce some of the traffic uh, uh, coming off the Navy base, uh, as well as help, uh, help move people at the Navy base. Uh, this is also another great opportunity for, for members or for local uh, uh, local people that, that live here to to get around the community and, and do things in a, a quicker more sustainable fashion and uh, we're going to be uh, uh, 
for presenting at the uh, Imperial Beach City Council meeting tomorrow. And we've been in discussions with uh, the Navy uh, as well as uh, uh, other, other uh, municipalities here in San Diego County. But just wanted to introduce the bike to you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, Mayor Bailey, honorable members of the city council, uh, I wanted to follow up on something Barry was saying. I'm sorry, my name is Bob Groby, and I also live at 5164th Street. Any relation? Yes. Uh, but uh, just a, a, a quick point that I don't think she got to make was just simply that in the supporting information relied, relating to item 10C, it mentions a specific figure of 24 blowers. I don't know if our equipment is included in that. If it's not, then I guess where I would go is, if it's not, and it's not going to be replaced uh, with electric blowers that we can use, then I would request an exemption like you're doing for the golf course. So that's, I think that's my only point, is that we want to make sure if we can't use our gas-powered blowers that we have access to electrical ones. And I haven't been able to determine that yet. So, but thank you for your attention. Thank you, Bob. Good afternoon. I'm Sue Gillingham representing the Coronado Chamber of Commerce. This is a brief advertisement for the upcoming Sundowner Mixer next Thursday, the 14th. It will be hosted by Miguel's and it will be in the courtyard behind in the El Cordova Hotel. Um, I bring it up because uh, there's a very special person who's going to be retiring here shortly from the city, Captain Blood. And we're going to be um, giving him a little special attention and thanking him for his service to our community and our businesses. Everyone is welcome to come and I hope to see you all there. Thank you. Sue, so what time does it start? And how do we get tickets? It's 5 o'clock. You can call the chamber and get tickets. You can go online and get tickets. The price for members is $25. Non-members is $35. If you want to bring your whole crew, it's $100 for five tickets. Um, and um, Miguel's puts a wonderful spread out, as we always know. Probably the favorite sundowner of the year. So get your tickets early. Thank you, Sue. We're all looking forward to uh, honoring Chief Blood. Are there any other comments? Oh, welcome. Hello, everyone. My name is Javier Gomez. I'm here on behalf of Assemblymember Todd Gloria with a couple of updates from our office. Um, an update on SB 507. This bill passed the Assembly Appropriations Committee on September 1st, this past Friday. This bill is co-authored by Assemblymember Gloria and Senator Weso. It authorizes $2.1 million for the restoration and recovery efforts associated with the Tijuana River Valley. The bill will now go to the full Assembly floor for a vote. A couple um, updates on our bills. Uh, Senator Member Gloria's bill was signed by the governor, our first bill to be signed by the governor. That's AB 187. Any questions or needs any help with any of our state agencies or is having any issues with our state agencies, this includes the DMV, the Franchise Tax Board, Medi-Cal, Medicaid, um, the ABC. Please give our office a call at 619-645-3090 or email me directly at javier.gomez, the number two, at asm.ca.gov. Thanks. Thank you, Javier. Carolyn Rogerson, Coronado Kays. Uh, on June 20th council meeting, city manager uh, Blair King alerted us to the fact that the California legislature is proposing a cell tower uh, extension um, bill that, and he explained and presented pictures of how it would impact uh, Coronado. Uh, Senate Bill 649, proposed by Democratic Senator Ben Hueso of San Diego, is also known as the Wireless Telecommunications Facilities Bill. On July 18th, this bill has been further amended. And not only does Bill SB 649 remove the existing required city and county discretionary permit process, it requires California cities and, and uh, counties to allow 
the proposed AT&T, Verizon, and other telecommunications operators to install their equipment pretty much as they wish. The amendment also removes the word small wireless, and it's replaced with communications, period. So in a, um, an editorial by the LA Times on July 5th, the editor describes uh, Senator Hueso's Bill 649 as an audacious 5G power pole grab. To quote, although wireless companies say the transmitters are typically the size of a pizza box, the bill allows for equipment up to the size of a small refrigerator. I don't know what that means. Unfortunately, our own uh, Democratic Senator Tony Atkins voted for this bill and its amendments, and I think we really have to stay on top of this. The reason I'm bringing this up today is that a young woman I know who has two children, they live in Manhattan Beach, they have a pole outside their house, and on Church Street, they received notice on Saturday that AT&T plans to put up a telecommunications box within view of their daughter's bedroom. So they are not given any discretionary option. The city manager in Manhattan Beach says, well, he can't do anything about it. I think it's incumbent upon us all to pay attention to this bill. Let our senator, let Assemblyman uh, Todd Gloria also know, we don't want this. We don't want our rights taken away from us as a city, as citizens, to say when and where and what size telecommunications equipment can be placed within our city, within residential areas, be it on public property, it's something we really have to stay on top of. So please call Tony Atkins and Todd Gloria and Senator Huesos and ask them to uh, I'll just tell them you're unhappy with this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional public comments? Good afternoon, Marvin Hines, uh, Six Bridge Town Bend. As I'm sure the council knows, September is National Preparedness Month. With the events of uh, Hurricane Harvey, we've seen the city of Houston have a really spectacular response because they were well organized and were ready far better than some of the cities in the past decade. Um, I'd ask the council to take a look at our emergency preparedness plans. If you look at our city plans, they're not exactly current. Uh, some of them have county standard uh, sections taken out of them. I think it's time for us to, to give our fire department some resources to take a good look at our emergency plans and make sure that we, Coronado, are ready for an emergency when that occurs. Uh, I don't think we have to worry about serious flooding, but there are other things such as earthquakes and those kinds of things that could affect us. And so I think it's time for us to take good hard review and update if we can find a way to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional comments? Going once, going twice? All right. City Council members. Javier, are you still here? Yes, in the back. Could you come up, because we were talking, you and I, offline about 649, and you told me you looked into it for Coronado and, and that uh, our uh, Main Street wasn't going to be, could you tell me what you told me so the rest of the council, I just want to hear? Sure, and I just looked it up at the bill making sure it wasn't taken out during an amendment, but it exempts all historical towns and coastal zones as well, so that includes national parks, so those would be exempt from the bill. Thank you. I could follow up. I'm sorry. Javier, I got another question. <laughs> the last time I reviewed it, it said coastal jurisdiction, not coastal zone. Was that amended to reflect coastal zone? Because there's a distinction between jurisdiction and zone. I spoke with the uh, author's staff directly, and that's, she told me that it was the coastal zone jurisdiction. The last version of the bill still has the jurisdiction, so still that needs to get fixed. Okay, I can bring that up. Take a note. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Gomez. All right, council members, any comments? One, one more, if I could. Council Member Downey. On uh, Friday, 
I've now misplaced it. Here we go. On Friday, I had the chance, I wanted to tell my fellow uh, council members, to talk with Ann Fox, who's the Deputy District Director at Caltrans. Um, one of the issues, as you all know, we have the synchronized uh, lights that have just been completed, although we're going to be finishing putting the pads out over on the lights between the Amphib base on uh, the bay and the ocean sides. And one of the issues that's taken a little while is figuring out how to set the pedestrian timers. Um, and that's one of the issues that uh, once we got the lights in, we needed to figure it out. And we all know that the vast majority of people that are crossing are seals, and they do not need the standard length of time to cross. And that delay for pedestrians is what causes a lot of the backup down the strand. So um, Ann Fox, who actually is in charge of the implementation of some of those policies, said Caltrans has a working group. She's talking. She's got a representative from Coronado, one of our staff she's talking to. As well, I ran into Gary Benelli, our port commissioner, also a retired uh, Navy SEAL Admiral. Um, about how they can try and address that in terms of timing that you may remember the problem was it was under the municipal or not the municipal I'm sorry the highway transport I can't remember that acronym but the manual that governs uh, the highway uh, transportation signs the length it had to be she said they are looking at helping us make that shorter when it becomes automatic because that's the one thing that we're concerned about now that we've got these great signals and it's supposed to work, if you can still override it every time there's a right. single pedestrian for the length of whatever it was, two minutes, that will cause problems. So I just want to let you all know they're very well aware of that. And they actually have folks that are looking to see how they can decrease that automatic amount of time that would happen for a pedestrian. Admiral Benelli uh, shared with me that when it is the full platoon crossing, they actually will uh, ignore the um, timer and once it starts they will just post and we've seen them do this in the past they'll post sentries that stand on either side till they get past so that's not going to be part of what's holding it up so they can still shorten it even though a platoon might take longer to cross if that's what they're crossing thank you for that update okay. all right we will now move on to the city manager report item 7a report to the city council on police department enforcement page 261 uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, I have a variety of uh, different items I'd like to report on. Uh, one of them is uh, we have some statistical information that uh, Police Chief John Furman would uh, like to present to you just to give you an update on the status of our efforts uh, with regard to uh, enforcement of traffic violations. Welcome, Chief. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Mm -hmm. The slide that is coming up, maybe it's on your screens, uh, depicts the, uh, a comparison of traffic enforcement activities in various categories that are of public interest. They are of the months June and July, and they compare 2017 versus 2016 activity. The total at the bottom does not is not a total of the columns or the lines above it. It's the total number of citations. There are other categories that are not noted on here. The 54% increase that's noted on the bottom is consistent with our year-to-date total, exactly 54%. Um, and that's about all I have to present, unless there's any questions. I don't have any questions, Chief, but I do want to say I find these statistics very helpful. I think it helps remind our public that we're keeping an eye on traffic enforcement, so I want to thank you once again for coming up. Council members, are there any questions on this item? Thank you, Chief. All right, thank you. Mr. Mayor, the other items I'd like to report on to you, just give you a verbal report on the school district's use agreement. Uh, as you recall, you approved an agreement uh, where we contribute $370,000 to school district in exchange for access by the city and the public to school district facilities. This agreement is a 12-month agreement which remo renews automatically unless some party, either party, asks for amendment or asks it to stop. It has been renewed then for fiscal year 17-18. Um, a couple items of note is that um, uh, it continues to allow the city access to the district's television studios, uh, the campus site for public safety training, campus site uh, for the recreation department, outdoor athletic facilities, district auditoriums, and tennis courts. Uh, several groups have had access that would not have had uh, two district facilities, uh, specifically uh, the writers' workshops and arts events. Uh, we also anticipate that we will have the next Avenue of the Heroes dedication ceremony event at the high school auditorium as well. 
Uh, I know that there is continual interest in expanding the hours for the high school track and field facilities. Those are currently open when the school is not open from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m., 52 weekends a year. Uh, I've expressed the uh, city's interest in expanding those hours with the district superintendent. This district superintendent has uh, communicated to me he is willing to work on expanding those hours, and that's something that we will continue to do uh, throughout the year without an increased expectation in reimbursement to the school district. Uh, thank you, Mr. King. I think this continues to be a win-win for both our taxpayers and also for the school district. Our, our residents have greater you know, recreational outlets, and our, of course our school district is receiving a financial benefit. I do think that uh, it would be beneficial for our residents if we could extend those hours further than simply 6 to 10 a.m. The, during the weekend. So I, I hope we can continue pursuing that. Council members, any comments? Um, uh, Mr. King, when I spoke with the superintendent, and, and you know how much I love this program and people were out using the track, um, I had asked him uh, whether it be the school district or the city, it, it isn't easy for a resident to know that they're, they have access during those hours. And I talked to him about posting it, and he agreed. So the question is for the two of you to figure out which institution posts that somewhere. I don't know if it's under our recreation if somebody went to. I don't know where a resident would look for it, but I think it should be somewhere. So somebody, if they were in Coronado and wanted to run a track, they could you know do a Google and find it. It. So if I could ask you when you're next talking with, with the superintendent to figure out how to do that. Uh, yes, and through the chair, uh, what I hear is the need to maybe put it on our website and, and broadcast it more through recreation. Also, in theory, and I haven't been out there at 6 a.m. on Saturday lately, uh, there should be sandwich signs that are placed at the entrance to the track. They are placed out at the same time we unlock the gate uh, to let the public know it's available to the public uh, for that. I have two other brief items, Mr. Mayor, if I could. Uh, one comment on oh, that, please, Mr. Benzie. You're switching topics. Really, I just um, hopefully if our superintendent is listening, um, I, the one thing I would I'd like to see is, is uh, use of our basketball courts. I know they're all they're all typically locked up, and uh, there's a lot of kids in town that probably like to shoot hoops, and they can't unless you're if the, if the rec center here is closed. There's really not a public court in the city of Coronado, um, other than I think the Coronado Caves has one. But uh, so. If you're listening, we'd love to see some access also, to the basketball courts. Also, Mr. Benzi and I are two people of a three-man team, so we need another place to play on the weekends. That's exactly right. Yes. <laughs> Um, so, yes, yeah, so we'll add that to the mix. And, uh, again, thank you for your comments communicated to the superintendent that there's a desire to expand those hours. Um, we have, uh, for the public to view, uh, a very, very brand new uh, ambulance. Uh, this is your new ambulance. Just uh, very briefly, the City of Coronado, uh, we operate emergency response. We operate transport service. Uh, we have two, an inventory of two ambulances. One is of the frontline ambulance. The second is held in reserve. Uh, as the council knows, we had an ambulance issue this past year. This is not that ambulance. That ambulance is still being, uh, the box is being placed on a new Dodge frame. Uh, but this is a brand new Dodge ambulance. It's just being placed into service now. Uh, this will be our frontline ambulance for the next seven years and then send it go into reserve. Uh, just so you know, uh, that represents an investment of about $400,000 of uh, the public's tax dollars in terms of emergency services. Um, and I don't know quite how long it will stay out there, but uh, if the meeting wraps up and we can, we'll try to leave the ambulance there. And the public and the council certainly invited to uh, stick your head into it and look at it, and hopefully that will be the only time you'll see the interior of an ambulance uh, ever. Uh, the last time I have is a commercial. Uh, that the police department has asked. The police department is putting on a great program. It's called a Police Citizens Academy. It is open to local residents, and it's an opportunity for you to learn a little bit more how the police department operates. If you have a curiosity, how accurate are the crime shows on TV? Uh, do crimes really get solved all in an hour? Um, but it is a free eight-week course. It is held once a week, one night a week. Uh, it will begin Wednesday, September 27th. The time the classes run are from 6 to 8. Again, you'll get a closer look at the police department. Uh, you'll learn about various police uh, operations. Uh, they even have a use of force uh, simulator that is available. So uh, how uh, police officers approach people, police officer safety, uh, command presence, those are all types of things that are covered in the uh, Citizens Academy. It's a great program. It's free. If you have some time in your hands, I'd encourage you to go ahead and take advantage of that. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. King. 
Next on our agenda is item 8A. Item 8A is a public hearing for the appeal of the outcome of a public hearing of the Historic Resource Commission on August 2nd, 2017, that the residence located at 1034 Encino Row was not designated as a historic resource in accordance with Chapter 84.20 of the Coronado Municipal Code on page 265. We did receive a request for continuation from the applicant, and if the council will do so, we can go ahead and continue that um, for our next regularly scheduled meeting on September 19th if that's okay with everyone here. As long as the city attorney says we're gonna make it in time for the appeal. Uh, I believe the request did not specific, uh, specifically ask for a specific date, so you may want to ask the applicant how much time they're requesting because we will have to re-notice it. That, yeah, just to me, is... Is the applicant, I imagine... A representative, somebody that can tell us? What, what, what do you want, Joe? Okay. Yes. Scott yes, hi. Um, thank you, Honorable Mayor. Uh, members of the council, my name is Scott Moomjian, representing Mr. Joe Dittler. You have my letter that I sent this morning. Um, that would be fine. We would very much like to uh, 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 entertain the uh, the two-week continuance, come back to you uh, on the 19th. That would be just fine. That work? If that is the case, then my recommendation is for the council to open the, the public hearing, continue it to a date certain, admonish the council that they are not allowed to discuss this item because it is an open public hearing and then there will not be a need to re-notice it. Is that, is that going to work for you all? You understand how that works, that we're opening it? Well, in, in which case, uh, would uh, then the council will be entertaining then public comment and, and so forth? Not it today. will be at the public hearing on September 19th. Okay, so the council then will not be entertaining uh, public comment on the item then today? Uh, if the council decides to continue it, that is correct. Okay, then that would be, that would be fine. Perfect. So we need to go ahead and actually open the public hearing then? Is that what you're advising? Uh, yes. If it's going to be continued to a date certain next meeting, then that would be um, the best way not to have to re-notice the item. This is a public hearing. The public hearing is now open. We will go ahead and continue this item to a date certain of September 19th. So just point it. Oh. The attorney. Um. Real quick, uh, point of clarification. Assuming that we do exactly what we just did, um, that means we can't talk to the applicant or the appellant at all about the topic, correct? That is correct. Because the, the hearing is open. That means all testimony and all evidence is going to come before oh, you parte. on September 19th. Gotcha. Yes. Okay, I just wanted us all to be clear on that. Thank you, Mr. Sankey. Can we entertain? Um, the public hearing is open. If the, app, the appellant and this case would like to be heard that is going to count towards the time that's going to be allotted to her at the next hearing if that is what the council desires. I have a question Mr. Mayor Susan Keith 801 Toledo since if, if I am if you can if you can if your question can be specific to what we're just discussing right now in terms of the process and when we'll be being it heard is. we won't count this towards your time but if it, it starts diverting into the specifics of this case we will. No 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 okay. I, I, it, it is to your continuance. Since I am the applicant for the appeal, would not it have been nice to have been noticed that there was and, a continuance? Let me go ahead and the continuance was requested after the agenda item went out. Let me go ahead and defer to our city attorney on the applicant versus the appellant. In this particular case, the request was provided after the agenda has been produced, which is why the applicant in this case was advised that the only way that the continuance is going to be heard is if it was actually asked during the council meeting, and that is why we have the letter. Um, and for due process purposes, the applicant is the one that would have a financial interest that is most impacted for any delay in development. In this case, they have requested and they have agreed that while it may be to their detriment to actually delay the hearing in this case, that is a request that they have made. Does that answer your question? No, it doesn't. I still don't understand why, as the person asking for the appeal, that I was not told or even asked if I agreed. This is the first thing anyone was told of it. The request for continuation was received, I believe, earlier today. It was received after the agenda don't, went out. Do I not have to agree? City Attorney? It is not required that you agree. It is a council d discussion whether or not it's going to be continued. Thank you. Thank you. Council, once again, are we okay with continuing to September 19th? And do we need a formal vote? Yes. Mayor? Yeah. Mr. Donovan? Not, not to beat a dead horse, but let me just to clarify, this is a procedural thing. Nothing will change as far as 
the the appeal or what what the process will be at the next meeting that is correct, is that correct? it nice. is a procedural method by which we don't have to re-notice if we have to re-notice the hearing it will be delayed longer than september 19th thank you is there a motion I move that we will continue this agenda item to the next uh, city council meeting. I'll second. Please vote. Motion passes, all voting aye. We will now move on to item 8B. Item 8B is a public hearing for the adoption of a resolution approving a one lot tentative parcel map to allow for condominium ownership of two residential units for the property addressed as 617 9th Street in the R3 multifamily residential zone, page 383. Mr. Fate? Yeah, Peter Fate will be uh, provided the staff report. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. The site is located on the north side of 9th Street between G and H Avenue. Please continue. Oh, you want me to wait? No, that's fine. Oh. So once the staff presentation concludes. Yeah, this is a public Benton, hearing. We can finish and, uh, up the public hearings in the And the council, uh, by, uh, by core interpretation, needs to be alert and awake and responsive during the presentation, during the public hearing. That's a tough threshold to clear sometimes. Um, Mr. Fay, please continue. Sorry, everybody. Okay. The lot has a 65 foot frontage along 9th Street and 50 feet um, along the alley. Total lot size is 3,252 square feet. No changes are proposed for the exterior lot lines. The existing dwelling will be demolished and replaced with a two unit condo. Rendering of that design is shown here in the bottom right. Two per unit or a total of four off street parking spaces will be provided off of the alley in this location in a tandem configuration with two open parking spaces and two enclosed parking spaces. Property is located in the R3 zone. The R3 zone for this size lot allows a maximum of two units, and that's what's proposed. This particular land use is consistent with the city's general plan and zoning ordinance. The parcel map also complies with the city's subdivision ordinance and the State Map Act. The Planning Commission conducted a public hearing on this item on July 11th, excuse me, and adopted a motion recommending city council approval. Staff recommends that the council adopt the resolution that's in your agenda, approving the map with findings and conditions. That concludes my report. Available for any questions. Thank you, council members. Any questions? All right. Thank you, Mr. Fate. This is a public hearing. The public hearing is now open. Would any members from the public like to comment on this item? Mayor, council members, uh, my name is Rick Turner with Kappa Engineering. I'm in the process of developing this. If you have any questions, I'm here. Thank you very much. Right. Seeing no further comments, the public hearing is now closed. Council members, are, is there a motion or a discussion? Would anyone like to make a motion? I'll move the staff right. right. Is there a second? Please vote. Motion passes, all voting aye. We will now move on to item 8C. Item 8C is a public hearing for the adoption of a resolution approving a one lot tentative parcel map to allow for condominium ownership of four residential units for the property addressed at 1115 through 1125 9th Street located in the R3 multifamily residential zone, page 395. Welcome back, Mr. Fate. Thank you. Similar request, um, just a different site in a much larger lot. Um, this is located at the northwest corner of the intersection of 9th Street and C Avenue. This lot has a 60 foot frontage along C Avenue and 140 feet along 9th Street. Total lot size is 8,395 square feet. Two existing dwellings are currently on the property. 
Those will be demolished and replaced with this four unit condominium building. This particular design, because it was three or more units, did go to design review commission approval and that was approved on April 26. Property is also located in the R3 zone. A lot of this size would allow a maximum of five units, but four units are proposed. Again, it's uh, consistent with zoning, uh, general plan, subdivision ordinance, state map act. Planning Commission uh, reviewed this item at the same meeting on July 11th and adopted a motion recommending your approval. Staff recommends that you adopt the resolution in your agenda approving the tentative parcel map. Thank you, Mr. Fate. Council members, are there any questions? Mr. Sankey. Peter, um, the, this happens to be right across the street the church I go to, and so I see that cute little white cottage all the time. Um, I see it's in a state of disrepair, but was any required uh, historical work done on what kind of house it was or, or, or that kind of stuff? Yes. Um, both of those dwellings were reviewed by uh, Historic Resource Commission, and they deemed them not to be historic, approving the notice of intent to demolish. Councilmember Benzian? Yeah, I'm curious who's developing this. Is it a local developer um, or is it someone off? Are we allowed to ask those I'm questions? Ask the, no. Are we not allowed to ask those questions? I'm just. You can ask who the applicant is. And it regard, you just, yeah. yeah and, and regardless of where they may reside. Sure. No, right. I didn't. Right. I'm just curious as to. I, I did fail to mention that this also will have um, two per unit total of eight off-street parking spaces off of the alley in a semi-below-grade tandem configuration. So, Mr. Fade, out of curiosity, who is the uh, applicant? Uh, that's probably a best question for Mr. Turner, I think, is representing them. Um, I don't know. Part of the reason it's required, I think, is that depending on who the applicant is, it may very well be a result in a potential disqualification from the council if that applicant is a, a source of income in the last 12 months. So it's, it behooves the applicant, in this particular, the representative, to inform the council who that may be. So on the application, it's described as LJR Homes LP based out of Rancho Santa Fe. Are there any conflicts on the city council for that? Terrific. Oh. Mr. Don Council Member Donovan, do you have a question? Could you throw the other the chart up before, or the last one you showed with the parking? Yes. Tandem parking, but is it, are they, are, is all the uh, parking enclosed, or, or is there any? Uh, no, uh, and you can see on this is a site plan, so tandem. The only the, f the furthest away from the alley are enclosed. So each unit will have one enclosed garage and one open parking space behind them. And those open parking places are on a on a slant, is that correct? That's correct, a slope. And that's permitted? Yes, it is, as long as it doesn't exceed 12%. And I see the grade is 14% here. Um, I think I, I misspoke. I think 14 is the maximum. So that's that looks correct. And we'll double check that during plan check. Councilmember Donovan, any additional questions? No, that's the point I was looking at, that it's going to be a slanted open open space going into the garage. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry, Mike. Oh, that's, we got the answer. Any additional questions? Council members? No. Nope. All right. This is a public hearing. The public hearing is now open. Would any members from the public like to comment on this item? Charles Creor. My only comment about this is the tandem parking. We keep increasing all these units. I mean, we're we, and when they do the tandems, every time I see them, the actual garage never gets used as a garage. It get, turns into a storeroom, and you so only you really end up with four parking places, and you are adding to the parking on our already overcrowded streets. I mean, it looks like it flies, but. I walk around all the time, I see the garage doors open in these situations, and in 90% of the cases, the tandem parking, the garage is, the enclosed garage is used as a storeroom. They don't, I mean, who, you'd have to shuffle cars around every time you wanted to trade out. If you, ha, if you had a car and whoever else was living there had a car behind you, and they're leaving and they're in front of you, you've got to go, nobody does that. 
So you end up with one car and another car on the street. We're just adding more traffic to cars to our street all the time. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional comments? Uh, Rick Turner with Cap Ups, still here. Um, it, he mentioned who the limited partnership was. Uh, the last name is Fry, and I don't believe he, I believe he lives in Coronado, but I'm not guaranteed. Um, and the parking situation, as you know, the latest RCIP demands that we have open parking spaces because of that. It used to be two car enclosed, and because no one was using their garages, that's why the latest change was made with zoning, and we're complying with the latest RCIP on this. Thank you very much. Are there any additional comments? All right, seeing none, the public hearing is now closed. Council members, is there a discussion or a motion? Uh, quick Council question, member. what what was the vote at planning commission? I, I should ask Peter that before. Was that a unanimous at planning for this? Do you recall? I'm looking for it in the uh, staff report, but I don't see it. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Motion or discussion? Perfect. Councilmember Downey? I'll move approval of the staff recommendation, and I'd, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Turner because he was one of the people that when we were talking about this over long periods of time that suggested the whole one enclosed, if you're going to do tandem and one open, for and, and Mr. Kior is exactly right. It drove me nuts that nobody ever parked in their garage. So this is, though, for us a little newness because it's going to be slightly elevated. So I, I'll be honest. I, I wish it wasn't. I think it'd be used more likely if it was completely flat. But um, I do think given the shortage of, of parking, people will wind up using it because the grade I don't believe is going to be that much that it would prevent people from parking. I think it probably looks parking. deeper than actually. Exactly. Right. I really think when you, when you see it, 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 people will park in it. So I, I'm happy because this is one of the larger multifamily that's going to use that format. So I, I'm uh, pleased because it's one less than they could have put on for the amount of, 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 of Units allowed in that location, so I think this is, you know, kind of a step down, and I appreciate both of those things being done. So I am happy to move approval of the staff recommendation. And is there a second? I'll go ahead and second. And so I, I think, you know, comparing this development to what it could have been, say, a year ago, this development has four additional open par open parking spaces than otherwise would have um, this time last year. So I think it's a uh, that was an action the council took. Um, Mr. Mayor, quick yes. question for the city attorney. Johanna, it's it's my understanding that this is uh, ministerial, or, or am I using the right word? No, I'm, we don't have a lot of um, leeway on this. It, 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 it fulfills all the requirements of our current code, and so voting no is somewhat superfluous. Well, unless you cannot make the finding that is required. Correct. All right. Thank you. Would you like to discuss any? No. Nope. To see it go. All right, Council, please vote. Motion passes, all voting aye. Thank you, Mr. Sankey. At this time, we're just going to take a really brief five minute break and we will come back to item 10C uh, when the Council comes back from recess.
is now back in session. With the council's indulgence, I'd like to reopen the public comment portion of the meeting. Would any members from the public like to speak? Please approach the microphone and state your name. Hi, I'm Alexander Wise, and I have a your honor. I have a question about why can't there be any dogs off leash in the Speckles Park? Well, yeah. or any park? I don't know. Like the village. I saw a sign so. that said no dogs allowed on the park. That's a great question. So typically during the public comment portion of the meeting, we're, on, we're not allowed to address these items. Uh, but since I'm the mayor, I'm going to defer to Mr. Donovan to answer that question. Oh! <laughs> well, actually, so our Coronado Municipal Code currently prohibits dogs being off leash in all parks in Coronado. We do allow dogs to be on leash on Vetter Park. I believe that's the only park in Coronado we can have a dog inside the park on leash. Bayview Park as well? Oh, really? Oh, gotcha. Oh, very nice. Oh, that's right. That's right. And Centennial? Centennial? But it's still on leash, though. So on Centennial leash. Park and Bayview Park. Bayview Park, Centennial Park, and Vetter Park. Um, but if the council would like at a later date, one council member could introduce a proposed policy change. And if that was something that the public wanted to see and they expressed support for having an off-leash dog park somewhere, that's something we could consider at a later date. Mr. Mayor, I would like to make a comment. Yes, Mr. Donovan. Uh, I would just want to remind everybody there is an off-leash dog park down in the Ks, so you can take your dogs down there. I do that all the time, and uh, it's a blast. It's really nice. It's a nice dog park. Great one. Any other comments or questions? No, I do not think so, Your Honor. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, no. do you have to? Do you guys all have to say your name to get your badge? Uh. Do Now's it. your time. No, you don't have to say your name. No? Um, uh, why can't there be one in the village? You would like to see Dog Park in the village? Yeah. All right, duly noted. Um, yeah. When, are you guys 18? Are you guys registered voters yet? Uh, sadly, no, sir. But someday. 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 All right, we'll keep that in mind. Well, thank you all very much for being here. Um, council members, would, would it be all right if we did a quick picture with the scouts? Absolutely. All right, let's do a quick picture with that. You guys want to come down to the front? Yeah, of course. Yeah. You want all of us? Whatever. Let's all come down. Yeah, we're here. Here, we'll have you guys. That's the best job. So, what trip is this? All right, now back to our regularly scheduled program. We'll move on to item 10C. Item 10C is the adoption of a resolution of the City Council of the City of Coronado directing that the city's gas-powered leaf blowers and weed whips and those used by its contractors accepting the golf course be converted to zero emission electric tools no later than December 31st, 2018 and report on the conversion during consideration of the fiscal year 2019-2020 budget, page 411. Mr. King. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. I'm just going to provide some stage setting before Cliff Meyer presents a PowerPoint presentation to you on this. First of all, just to remind you, this came about because the council asked on July 18th that uh, staff present information and you would consider uh, a ban on gas-powered hand tools. As a result of that direction, uh, staff conducted some research. We uh, surveyed other cities. We looked at an extensive public hearing that the council conducted in 2004 in response to a request to ban leaf blowers. Uh, based upon that, uh, staff is, uh, and we have made an assumption that the council may want to move in the direction of endorsing uh, 
zero emission hand tools. We basically are recommending that if you want to take that action by resolution, that you would direct that all the city's gas powered leaf blowers and weed whips uh, and those used by our contractors on city property, excepting the golf course, be converted to basically zero emission or electric tools no later than December 31st, 2018. In other words, it would give us a year plus a couple of months and that we would report on the conversion during uh, the consideration of the fiscal year 1920 budget. Basically, in terms of, as Mr. Maurer suggests, that uh, the conversion uh, may involve some more complications than what we've identified here. We're suggesting if you're interested, you could move towards proof of concept of both the pragmatic impl implications to the uh, conversion of these tools, and that we do it first with the city's tools before we impose a standard upon uh, the residents of Coronado or private businesses. Uh, Mr. Maurer has, uh, uh, he will run through, explain what we believe is the case for uh, going to zero emission tools, uh, the reasons why we believe that it would be difficult to go citywide to zero emission hand tools, and then again focusing on what our recommendation is uh, for the City Council to consider, and that, uh, uh, and the very steps of it. Uh, sir, can you leave the podium where it was? <laughs> Good evening, Mayor, Council members. Um, uh, I would like to first clarify what was brought forth in public comment earlier, that uh, the, the two pieces of uh, leaf blowers that are used by the lawn bowling and maintained, owned and maintained by the city were included in our numbers. They were. Okay. Yes, that's, that's correct. Thank you. So I, I do have a, uh, a presentation for you. If we could. Thanks. Um, for, first off, I'd like to just, uh, and I think the city manager King went through most of this here, but uh, just address address the issue. Uh, uh, there's mo multiple problems with gas powered uh, um, lawn and garden equipment, or as you see there, GLG is the acronym used for that. Uh, engine noise is usually one of the largest, and then uh, probably with the, the state and environmental groups, the biggest concern isn't as much the noise as it is the air pollution that creates uh, much of this equipment is uh, two-stroke engines, which uh, has the lubricant instead of in the crankcase, it's actually in the fuel. So uh, it uh, has emissions of uh, NOx or nitrogen oxides, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and particulate matter 10 and 2.5, all of which are concerns for our environment. Um, uh, and then, of course, the noise is always an issue as well. Uh, to date, uh, or in recent years, uh, there's not been a big appetite for conversions. Usually what you see is a ban, not conversion to electric, because, frankly, uh, commercial-grade uh, hand, hand um, GLG has just not been available, uh, at least not in a suitable uh, level of performance. Uh, that's changing. Uh, the major manufacturers are responding to the need. Battery technology through electric vehicles and the like has advanced significantly. And now we're seeing um, some, some types of equipment that, that are comparable uh, to the gas-powered. Um, uh, and as uh, Mr. King alluded to, probably one of the biggest issues for cities that have done total bans is the enforcement. Uh, certainly we can control our own people. Uh, we can control the contractors that work for the city. But for the, all the contractors that work for, for private residents or for small commercial entities within the city, uh, that becomes very, very difficult. Um, uh, California Air Resources Board as their studies say that by the year 2020, so just a couple years off, 
that the emissions from uh, GLGE will exceed the emissions from cars in California. Uh, and it's hard to believe that a handheld uh, gas-powered leaf blower or weed whip uh, has more emissions than a, than a car. Uh, it actually has more emissions than 10 cars. Uh, it is rather significant uh, because it it's, it's doesn't have catalytic converters, doesn't have all, it, it's impossible to put that type of technology in something that you have to carry around by hand. Uh, the good thing is, as I said, the industry that produces this equipment has advanced significantly um, with the leaf blowers and the weed whips. Uh, the performance isn't one for one. Uh, what our research shows is probably about 75 to 95 percent uh, productivity. Um, there are some, as I list up here below, there are some disadvantages, one of which uh, for for a, a worker who's out working a large area, let's say the golf course with a leaf blower or a weed whip, they can work for hours on end without having to stop. Uh, if you're going to use even the most advanced electric equipment, you're going to be switching batteries out about every 30 minutes. Um, people say, well, a residence, you can use cords. You, you can for a small residence. You certainly can't do that for a park or Orange Avenue medians or golf course or, or something of that nature. Um, like I said, the performance rating is getting closer. Uh, I expect over time that that will improve, probably within the, the period that what Mr. King explained, which we would like to phase this in. Uh, we'll, we'll probably see more models available, more brands available, and maybe into some of the other areas. Right now, the leaf blowers and the weed whips are the only two handheld chainsaws, pole saws, edgers. Right now, they do not have suitable substitutes uh, with uh, no emission um, engines. So the recommendation is to allow this city to start this using our own, our own inventory of equipment, leaf blowers and weed whips, and then have our contractor, and right now that's Urban Core, um, and there will be a cost to them because they'll have to convert some of their equipment, and then we do recognize there'll be some loss of productivity, so it'll take more man hours to get the same job done. So that'll have to be, um, there will have to be a modification to our contract to adjust with that. Um, but I think, I think it'll work. Uh, that, the gas-powered equipment typically has a life of three to four years. So if we do this conversion over 16 months, remainder of this calendar year and all of next calendar year, some of the gas-powered equipment would have been due for replacement anyway, about a third of it. So uh, we're, we're only talking about the cost differential as opposed to getting rid of or putting off to the side perfectly good equipment. Uh, in some cases, we'll have to do that because some of it will not be due, but it'll be partially used up anyway. Um, uh, we don't think that th we're ready to go with the golf course yet because of, of the performance standards on the golf course, uh, the size of the golf course, the need for for when, when the, they have the availability to be doing this work when the golfers aren't golfing um, would r probably require additional personnel, which the um, Golf Enterprise Fund would really struggle in um, uh, taking that on at this point. Um, and again, I, I kind of brushed over it, but enforcement for local contractors uh, would, would really be a challenge uh, for the police department or whoever we decided would be the enforcing agent for that. Um, I think as the industry moves on and we prove it can be done, uh, there will be a lot of pressure uh, to move to electric and hopefully uh, the battery lives will get longer. Uh, the infrastructure necessary to charge those batteries. One thing we'll have to do is for our parks trucks, we'll have to put inverters in them and charging <laughs> stations in the trucks so that they can charge the batteries while they're working and have, have a ready supply of batteries uh, for doing this. So that, that essentially is, is what our recommendation is. Let's start with the city and the city's contractor. Look at this for the next 16, well, put it in place by the end of next calendar year and then evaluate and come back to council and say what, uh, what if any, the next step should be. 
I, I have one final side, just some, some cost information. This is all included in the staff report. Uh, the battery powered are a little more expensive because you have to buy the extra batteries and the chargers. Um, there is a fuel savings. Uh, obviously, once you have the batteries, the electricity is cheap compared to the cost of uh, uh, buying uh, gasoline for the gas powered. However, uh, your people take longer to do the work, so that offsets the savings and cost. And then uh, I did mention the city contractor additional cost, the conversion, and then the annual operating cost. So subject to your questions. Councilmember Benzian, this was your item initially. Would you like to lead us off on questions? Just questions. Um, no, I don't have any questions. Well, well um, no, you answered actually most of my questions, I think. Mayor Pro Tem thank you. Mr. Mayor, um, the city contract conversion costs fifty dollars to $100,000. Do we cover the cost for our contractor on that, or does that come out of our budget, or do we just tell the contractor by the end of this period of time you're going to be on all electric and they're responsible for it? Well, if we rebid the contract, we could well, we would change it. But right now we're on we're on base in multi option years, so that would be a modification to the contract. That is not what Urban Core bid when they originally contract. So we'd be responsible to give them a fair and reasonable, equitable adjustment to the contract because we're changing the terms of the contract. Councilmember Donovan, did you? Please. Uh, yeah, Cliff, thanks for the presentation. Just a couple of questions. I, I noticed that the study that you referenced that said that those uh, gas engines put out as much as a car was done in 2000. <clears throat> Pardon me. And then I think I read somewhere else in the report that in 07 or so, they started making some pretty big advances on the smaller engines. So the 2020 number, or the 2020 date that you referenced where these smaller engines would exceed uh, vehicles. Is that still valid, or have there been more improvements made on the uh, handheld devices? On the gas-powered, yeah, yeah. handheld. Uh, they, some have switched to um, uh, four-stroke engines as opposed to two-stroke engines, which have better emissions. Clearly, they don't have the pollution control that, a, that an automobile can have for a, for a four-stroke engine. Um, I, that is the latest information from the CARB. We checked. They don't have. They don't have more recent information. I think there's been some improvements, but there's only so far they can go, just because of the reality of how much it can weigh and what what a person can carry doing that type of work. Okay. And then my other question is on the batteries. I noticed the batteries typically last for 30 minutes. But if we had multiple batteries out in the field, I mean, is that something they can swap out in the field? Oh, absolutely. Yes. No, so you, and then that's what we're talking about is having battery chargers on the trucks so they allow the inverters to be able to charge the batteries at the trucks, and then they can, but it, nevertheless, it, it impedes progress or productivity while they're out there working. If you have to stop, go back to wherever the battery is, even if it's close by, uh, it, it's going to disrupt uh, the work that they're doing. So there's no doubt there is a loss of productivity. Uh, I'm confident that over time those batteries will have longer lives. I mean, we're already seeing it with electric vehicles. Um, and if they can get up to two hours as opposed to 30 minutes, then, then the, the battery switch out will probably have very little impact on productivity. Thank you. Any other questions? Council Member Downey? Thank you very much, Cliff. I looked into this a uh, while ago. I was actually around in 2004, and so listened then. And we certainly have come a long way since then. But I did some uh, discussions with some of the gardeners in town, asking them what kind of impact if we went further. And I appreciate that you're suggesting we try it first, because they brought up three issues. One was the battery life, and for each of them, they're just like our folks on the golf course. They would have to have a million batteries put inverters because they're all day long using theirs. So they just don't have the ability to have the trucks with those inverters on it. So they expressed to me uh, the cost for any of the average gardeners out there is going to be huge because it's just going to have to be all those batteries. Um, but one of the things that I, I asked them about, and, and you mentioned in one of your slides, there's only two items right now that you can even use the, the battery that they have not produced battery or electric for all those others, including trimmers and 
Well, I, I wouldn't say they haven't produced it. Our research has shown that there's not a, a suitable substitute at the commercial grade. So certainly you can, as a private homeowner, you can get everything in electric for, for your private resident, but professional or commercial grade, uh, they're, they're, not, they're not at that level that you could actually be produ do productive work and have the durability that you need. And that would be, obviously, for our grounds folks, but also the professional uh, correct, gardeners. Correct. Or for e even uh, the for guy who's working out of the back of his you know, 1985 Datsun pickup truck, um, he, he, wouldn't, he can't use residential grade stuff. It won't last. He has and to have commercial That's grade. what I thought. Um, the third question that... Um, uh, some of them brought up to me, which I thought was interesting. You use that example of the 1985 uh, uh, truck. A lot of them store everything in the back of the truck. He said there is some concern about theft because that time that the individual gardener is going to go back to the truck to deal with switching out the batteries, that leaves some equipment laying out. So for them, there was a little bit concerned more equipment needs to be carried everywhere and it has to be, they have to see it all, otherwise the risk of theft is quite high. Um, in your research, did you see any problems with that, or is it, were you just looking at people that that's not an issue? Um, I'm not saying it's not an issue. We didn't address that. And then the, the fourth question that I had, because I, I asked them, I said, is there any ability to change fuel type to help with the emissions? I mean, with cars, you can go down to ethanol. You can do other kinds of things. But I was unfamiliar if they could substitute fuel in any of the, the gas equipment. Are you familiar with that being an option? Um, I'm not. All I did, kind of going back to Councilman Donovan's question is, is these engines are not as sophisticated as as a uh, automobile. So uh, I'm not saying it can't be done, but I'm not sure. And you had mentioned, um, and, and thank you for the staff report talking about other cities, what they've done. Um, for the ones that are concerned about noise, not just the emissions, um, We've got hours when you can operate equipment in Coronado. I just want to confirm that the operation of leaf blowers and all those fits into the same uh, hourly uh, constraints as construction would. So people aren't allowed to do leaf blowers at 6 a.m. Correct. Correct. There, there, there's no change there. And uh, with leaf blowers and weed whips, there's obviously less engine noise, but the fan still makes a lot of noise. So there, there's going to be some noise. It's a little bit less with the no emissions equipment, but it's not nothing. Thank you so much. Thank you. Council Member Donovan. I have one, one more question, Please. if I could. Um, does the state of uh, California have any guidance or ordinances along the lines? I noticed all of the uh, information that's in, the, in your report has to do with individual cities right. and they're making their own calls but is there any overarching anything coming down from the state on I asked the city manager to oh actually so the question is uh, has the state of California done anything uh, the air resources board is putting out information but uh, I think um, both Mr. Meyer and I are speculating based upon our experience that it, this is one of those issues that the state of California and I'm going to be a little bit cynical, can't help itself. It, we expect that we will have a mandate uh, sooner or later. Um, at that point in time, then the ability to transition may go away. But uh, as more and more cities take a look at a complete ban, um, that will be more likely. So. The answer is no. There is no state mandate at this time. The California Air Resources Board is putting out information, and they are sponsoring some of the testing of commercial grade hand tools. Um, enforcement is still a concern how that might be done, but we do expect that we will have a state mandate uh, coming from Sacramento. Does that answer your question, Mr. Donovan, or do you have anything else to add? Although Mr. in the report it notes that there's a, there's a, there's a California State and Health, Health and Safety Code um, that says no person shall discharge from any source air contaminants that cause injury, detriment, nuisance, or annoyance to the public. That's a state and health code. Uh, uh, the issue with that is the enforcement. Your city attorney's office does not have the ability to actually pr prosecute under that state prohibition. Right. Sure. That would okay. be an AG or a DA's office. Policy, yeah. Councilmember Downey? 
One more question. Um, I like that we're going to go into this gradually because the state may have other plans for yes. us in the near future. But what concerns me then is what uh, Barry Groby talked about because we have a lot of people are putting in artificial turf. Our, our school district has artificial turf. We have at our uh, a version of artificial turf at Lawn Bowling. Um, I'm a little bit concerned if the state is going to go to a total ban. I'm trying to figure out how are we going to deal with the artificial turf if we're not allowed to blow um, with the lawn blow? In other words, if we can't have any leaf blowers at some point in time, are you aware of any other mechanism that will help the artificial turf? Well, I, if I could, I, I think where the state is leaning towards is the emissions portion. So uh, this, is, this is a big market sector for the businesses that make this type of equipment. Uh, they are catching on quick. They see what the future is pushing, and they are putting a lot of R&D money into making commercial, professional grade, no emissions equipment. So I think that's where it's going to go, and there's probably a desire to see that happen, and California likes to be a leader in forcing industry to get to where they need to go. So I agree with uh, Mr. King that more than likely we will see at some point in the future, a marker put out there in California, you'll have no emissions, GLG. No emissions, okay. This, this day. Council members, does, does that conclude questions or are there others? All right, thank you, Cliff, very much. Would any members from the public like to comment on this item? All right, seeing none. Council member Benzian, this was your item. Would you like to lead us off for discussion? Sure. Um, thank you very much. Um, I get you know when I proposed this memo, I was thinking first that I wanted this to be focused on the residents and the citizens of Coronado uh, because frankly that 's where we 're seeing a lot of the noise um, a lot of the the issues there and it is it, it is is very loud um, but i after reading the city manager 's report, I think it is it 's wise to not impose uh, rules on people when you 're not uh, abiding by them yourself so um, I do think it 's a good uh, start. Um, that said, I would like to see us uh, revisit this issue, um, you know, maybe in a year, year and a half, and, and see if it makes sense to start bringing um, um, a, a similar policy to, to the entire community. Um, and I think people are going to be willing to do it. I, I don't think it's going to be something people are, are, are very opposed to. In fact, um, Supervisor Ron Roberts over the bridge I know has an annual program he's been doing for 20 plus years. It's sponsored by the Air Quality Control Board in which you can bring your um, equipment to the county administration building and for $99 they'll replace your um, your tools. So um, it's it's a positive thing. It's a it's a positive step in the right direction the city is hopefully moving towards um, and I think that kind of stuff is going to make that kind of those programs will make it less cost prohibitive for small business owners uh, as well as, as residents. So I'm hoping um, that will catch on down the road. So for now, no, I'm, I'm very comfortable with this uh, program as it is. You know, I would like to see the golf course um, be converted as well, but I certainly respect staff's opinion on this and hopefully again another thing we can revisit um, down the road and see if it makes sense. Uh, once technology and time has, has passed. So, um, th again, thanks everyone for bringing this to the council. Thank you, Cliff. And a uh, quick question for you, Mr. Benzine. Are you more concerned with the, the gas emissions or the noise or, you know, both equally in terms of? Um, both, but really I kind of looked at, I originally brought it up as a noise. It came to me uh, the thought as a noise issue. I mean, you can't, we are, our town is so dense, we're so close to each other um, that, you know, my little babies wake up <laughs> to uh, lawn, uh, uh, leaf blowers occasionally. I know uh, friends and neighbors do as well. And then the more I looked into it, I realized, wow, this is a really, really big environment mental issue as well. Uh, and as I wrote in my memo, you know, we have a lot of noise in this town and a lot of it we can't control, whether it's airplanes and traffic. These are one of the things where we can help kind of manage around the edges and, and I think um, will make a strong impact on the quality of life for our residents. Council members, thank you. Well, I have personally benefited from the county's trade your mower program in, and so I mow my lawn now with an electric mower. It's lighter, and it's about half as half as noisy, maybe less than half as noisy. I do have an electric blower as well still, and it's loud. Um, in, in terms of emissions, I, I, I concur that this is the right way to go. In terms of noise, I, I actually would entertain some time restrictions tighter than the 7 to 7, um, and I would certainly defer to the... 
uh, conversation on the dais here as to maybe eight to six or something along those lines. Tighten it up so your little ones don't get woken up by uh, by me and my electric right. blower. Um, and I won't be doing my lawn at 7.30 in the morning anyway, so I'm not sure that it's going to hurt hurt folks around town that much. Um, but anyway, so th I, that's kind of where I'm sitting on this one. Thank you. And in terms of imposing an overall ban versus having just the, uh, the city adopt some changes? I'm very, very pro-incremental approach. And I think us taking the first big steps here and seeing how, the, um, how that works out for us is a, a really good idea. Okay. And I applaud staff for that direction. Okay. Council Member Downey? I concur uh, with my fellow council members. And actually, Mr. Sankey, that's what I was thinking of. Not at this point. It's not on the agenda. But maybe we look at, for noise issues, um, maybe starting a little later in the morning for those. But that'll have to be another topic. And maybe when it comes back after, uh, uh, whenever we're going to bring it back, that we could let the public have an opportunity to opine on if we're picking the right time. Not to beg a legal question with a lawyer. <laughs> But we, our staff report does include comparison ordinances from up and down the state. Many of them talk about the different time restrictions. I'd ask the city attorney if it would be possible for us at this time to do that. And if your answer is no, I certainly respect it. I think that's a good question, Mr. City Attorney. I just looked at the title of the um, proposed action before you, and it's if you are considering, you know, it did say there's additional um, you can get additional direction. So if the council so choose, you can direct staff to come back with proposal if that is the consensus at the dais. So no, you may not discuss it in detail right now, but instead of going to policy two and having to come back, you may direct staff to actually come back to you at a later time with proposals. So it sounds like we have at least two council members that might be interested in coming back at a later time for future discussion on a separate item. Council Member Downey, do you have anything else you'd like to add? Generally speaking, are you satisfied with this resolution? Very much with the incremental approach. Okay. Mr. Donovan? Yeah, I, I'm in, in favor of this approach. I thought that was a very good idea to start with the city as opposed to start pushing this out. Uh, I think one... Um, one way, uh, the reason the golf course, I think, we wouldn't want to change. The good thing about that is that it's, uh, it's, there's no homes around. I mean, there are homes across the street, but it's a large area, so the noise shouldn't be as bothersome. Um, the emissions, of course, will still be an issue. Uh, by the way, there's another emissions angle to this, and that's the stuff that gets blown up into the air. And um, I guess from what I read, I learned a lot reading the sort of the lessons learned matrix that uh, was put together on, on the other cities. And some of the conclusions I, I came to were, first of all, enforcement is going to be really tough, no matter how you look at it. And there were some pretty specific comments, you know, the fact that the guys doing the lawn work get smart and they just do it at the very end and then, blow, and then they're gone. So there's some, you know, tricks around you know, be it hard, making it hard to enforce. Um, I also agree with the timing, if we can talk, talk about that at another time. Uh, just to clarify, my understanding is we can use these kind of, uh, this equipment between 7 in the morning and 7 at night and not on Sundays or holidays. Is that, is that the way it works right now? So, yeah, I would, I would be in favor of looking on maybe reducing the, the amount of time. Uh, I thought we might also think about some other stuff. Uh, going along with the pollution that gets blown into the air just from the, from the leaf blowers, apparently, and I wasn't aware of this, but there's some training that seems to be valuable to some of the cities uh, that allows less of, of the uh, air pollution to be blown up. And uh, honestly, I don't have a clue. I, I always thought you just take the blower and blow everything in a pile. You're one of those, huh? Yeah. Well, I've never used one, to be honest. But can we just prohibit Donovan from owning a... <laughs> but uh, maybe if we, if we discuss the timing down the road, if we could also add to the agenda, maybe look at uh, requiring some kind of training or at least have our, our city folks understand if there's a better way to use these blowers to, to reduce the amount of pollution that gets blown up into the air, I think that would be a good thing. 
Uh, and then I just wanted to confirm the costs. Uh, it looked like it was about 37000 to do the actual equipment change out. And then if we keep the golf course the way it is, there's no impact there. But it looked like we needed four more people in public services, full-time equivalents at about 362000 So in round numbers, it would be about $400,000 plus the maintenance for the batteries and that kind of thing. Is that? Can you, can you address that, Mr. Maurer? Uh, the uh, four was if we went for the full golf course um, oh, okay. and all the equipment, and uh, we we wouldn't require any additional personnel for public services. We uh, I think there would be more man hours applied for a contractor, and uh, we'll have some more man hours, but uh, it won't be to a point that it's going to be high cost. So. Okay. If, if, if I could just quick on your particulate matter from the blowing, there, there's no doubt, that, that, and we will, we will take on training our folks, uh, but it was interesting to learn that if you did the same task using rakes or brooms, the amount of particulate matter that goes in the air is comparable, not significantly different. Now, a lot of people won't do the same task with rakes and brooms, yeah. but if they did the same task to the same level of cleanliness, the particulate matter that goes in the air from the leaves or dust or sand or whatever you're blowing is almost almost the same. So just to put a number on the table, it looks like it would be 37000 to sh change out the equipment, and then I noticed 98000 for our contractors. So we're talking around $135,000, $140,000 to do this? Uh, yes, to the chair. I think that's what we would uh, look at. Again, we gave ourselves uh, a year and you know, what, four months to, yeah, uh, next to implement that. So we would be implementing this over that period of time. And during that period of time, we would give notice to the contractors. As Mr. Maurer said, uh, we would probably have an adjustment then uh, to let the uh, contractors. And uh, we would could reduce that cost by allowing people the longest period of time to amortize their current investment before they go to another investment. But yes, that would be the, the cost. Um, Mr. Mayor, I've also just an observation. Well, staff put as an alternative one of the issues, depending upon which issue the council wants to resolve, is to seven to seven. But also, we did note for you that currently in the municipal code, uh, there is a requirement that leaf blowers be muffled. Um, we have not checked with the police department, or we have not checked with any code enforcement to see if we've ever issued a citation for an unmuffled leaf blower. Um, although, again, it's part of the municipal code, nor have we done a sweep to see how many leaf blowers in Coronado are muffled. I would venture to say the majority of them are not. Um, so th the issue of enforcing the current code uh, may be something that you would want to give us the opportunity to look at before we modified the code to see if that would make any difference. We could also go, judge what kind of backlash uh, we might receive if we start informing uh, property owners or professional gardeners that their uh, leaf blowers need to be muffled. Council members, did you want to jump in, Mr. Sankey? Uh, okay. In my experience, that the leaf blower that I use is not muffled, but it is electric. And I wouldn't imagine that any of the electric ones really are, in a sense, have a muffler attached to them, but I think some of the gas ones do. And then I, would just, I was just going to comment. I think, you know, based looking at those charts that uh, Cliff provided, it does seem like enforcement is an issue, but some of the cities, uh, Carmel by the Sea comes to mind, said they, they didn't have much trouble. I know they're more of the outlier, but because they're such a small, tight-knit community, there is that sense of um, people wanting to respect their neighbors. And I, you know, one would hope that in Coronado it would be, uh, it, it would be similar. And I know this would not fly, but there have some cities I read elsewhere outside of this report, I think you can... Um, uh, private residences, once it go, if we ever went down that direction, find them. You know, you can find it can be fined if their gardeners aren't abiding by the the rules as well. But that's probably a little strict. But uh, something there's there are more mechanisms and um, uh, that could help with enforcement for a uh, future discussion, perhaps. Yeah. All right. So, council members, it sounds as though we have a couple other comments. Council member Downey. 
if we're going to be going this path to to look at what the city's going to do and then possibly force it on other people, I don't know that I'd want all the gardeners to go out and buy mufflers when in a year we're going to tell them they've got to replace everything. and it, That won't be appreciated. You know, so I'm, to be I'm frank, just, I can't imagine we'd do a good job of enforcing it anyways. So I, I, as much not as because I our police department is not competent no, to do that, but because just, I have other, we have other priorities. So I, I don't think I want to go to enforcing mufflers while we're going through this. I, I would concur. Mr. Donovan? Uh, my comment was just going to be, I don't know how in the world you enforce that. I mean, other than having police officers running around with noise detectors, I mean, I just, there's no practical way. I mean, unless the thing is just blatantly, you know, 200 dBA or something. So I, I'm not too worried about that. My, I'll tell you, my, my greatest concern around this, this resolution that we're considering right now is, is, the, is the extra work that's going to be required of our city staff if they're having to go back and change out the batteries and whatnot. Um, so that is one consideration I have. It sounds like there's a consensus to go along and move forward with this, but I just wanted to share that for the record. And it also sounds like there's consensus to have staff bring back at a later date an item for consideration that perhaps would limit the time duration during the day that leaf blowers could be operated for the entire city. Does that pretty much sum up what we're, what we're getting at? Would anyone like to make that motion or one other comment, Council Member? I'm Benning? happy to make the motion, but when they come back, one of the issues is our noise ordinance is a lot of it has to do with construction and professionals, and they can only go uh, uh, Monday through Saturday. They don't do Sunday. But an individual homeowner can work on their home on Saturday and Sunday. So I'm not sure an individual homeowner, such as Bill, who does his own yard, is precluded from doing that on a Sunday. So I'd like, when it comes back, I'd like sure. to talk about that. I don't know we want to change that, but I just, I think we need Better to be aware. Discussion. Sounds good. Uh, council members, there's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? I'll second. Let Mr. Benzian second that one. Nope. Too late, Mr. Donovan. All right, here we go, Mr. Benzian. <laughs> thank you, thank you, City Clerk. All right, please vote. Motion passes. All voting aye. All right, we have one item left on our agenda. That's item 10A. I'll ask the council members to submit item 10A in writing. The regular meeting for the Cornell City Council is now adjourned, and we will now move on to the. We'll reconvene our closed session meeting beginning now.